Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Liz. And thank you to everyone um, for, for joining us today. We're really excited to be able to, to bring you information uh, about our our organization and this this latest effort um, that we have underway. So just want to take a moment to introduce everyone. Um, you've, I think you've all met Liz. She runs our um, community partners network. Um, and we're also joined by um, some faces that may not be as familiar to you. Lindsay Volo, who is um, on our policy and advocacy team. Um, Denise Mariano, who is uh, runs our, our, our parent partners and um, is on our policy and advocacy team as well. And one of our beloved parent partners, Tanya Ahern from New Jersey, who we're really delighted um, can be with us today. And she is a, a super advocate. Um, so we're, we're so excited to, to begin um, the webinar. So should we pull up the slides, Liz, so we can start? Fantastic. Can so just a, yeah, we can see it. Okay, great, thank you. So I will kick things off just by giving folks um, a, just a little bit of background about the partnership to end addiction. A lot of you are already our community partners and and know all about us, but I know there are some people who um, for whom we may be newer. Um, so just want to make sure that we're all starting on the same page. The partnership to end addiction is the result of a merger of two of the oldest and largest organizations in the substance use field: um, the National Center on Addiction and Substance Use at Columbia University and um, the Partnership for Drug-Free Kids slash Partnership um, uh, for Drug-Free America. Um, and they, we all came together about two years ago, really bringing together um, two very different and complementary areas of expertise. And at the center of all that we do um, as a joint organization um, is really families. Um, we exist to, to, to empower families, to advance effective care, to help people's loved ones, to shape public policy and really tear down the barriers that are preventing people from getting the care that we need and really changing culture so that we're looking at substance use and addiction um, as a public health crisis rather than a criminal justice challenge. Um, and you know, as it says at the bottom, we help the helpers and help families find answers. So that's sort of a backdrop to all that you'll hear about today and a description of, you know, of, of what really our, our, our day-to-day -day work is and, and our, our organization's mission. So Hi, everybody. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, Turning Martha. it over to Denise. Um, thanks, everybody. And I also thank you for being here. Um, so what we thought we'd do is a very brief advocacy overview before we segue into our new project and advocacy tool that we'll be speaking about today. So Liz, if we can go to the next slide. Um, as you read this slide, I think of my journey here and therefore the constituents maybe in your communities. I always had a fear of advocacy, you know, why am I interested in advocacy? Where do I begin? How can I be a part of this change? Um, and so um, advocates honestly put a human face on addiction, making it a tangible way that fact sheets and statistics alone um, cannot. We understand how stigma that surrounds this issue can stifle and suppress our voices um, as an advocate. Um, and as your constituents being advocates, you can really be that force for change. Um, the more policymakers hear from us and fellow constituents about a problem, the more likely um, that we can make this issue a priority. Um, and again, I, I really want to draw, even since this, the pandemic, um, advocacy can take place in the community, state, or federal level, and we don't have to go to Washington, D.C. I'll hit a little bit more upon that in uh, a further slide. If you can go to the next slide. Um, advocacy comes in many different flavors. Um, and what we've done here is just kind of outline the different tactics. Um, as you think about maybe I am interested in advocacy, how much time do I have? How much am I willing to share right now? So we could have that low lift 
um, for advocacy, which is maybe just making a, a post on social media. And an example of that would be today, the House of Representatives passed the Family Support Services Act, a crucial step to involve and engage families, urge your senators to co-sponsor the action. Um, this act right now. That could be a retweet from us. It could be a little personalized message, but it takes two minutes, right? That could be the beginning of your advocacy journey. Um, and then there's those medium lifts, right? Um, attending a town hall. Many members of Congress host town hall meetings when they are home in their districts. Um, town halls provide an amazing opportunity um, for you to lift your voice, ask questions. Um, they provide an open forum which lawmakers can give legislative updates and answer questions from their constituents. Um, and again, um, just driving back that point that we don't have to be in DC today, many of them are virtual. So really a wonderful place to start your advocacy as well. Um, even if you just sit on them and, and get educated. Um, or you can send a letter or email to Congress. We'll go over an action alert um, later in the next slide. And maybe that high lift is attending a meeting with your congressman or your staff, right? Involves more time involves more of you sharing, having that courage and willingness to share maybe your story. And um, another high lift that we're gonna be hitting a lot upon when Lindsay um, shares our new project is just sharing your story. Um, so again, it could be two minutes, it could be an hour, or it could be you vesting your personal experience and story and a little bit of a higher um, push there. If you can go to the next slide. Um, partnership advocacy tools. Um, we have a national network of family advocates representing 50 states, an advocacy toolkit, um, action alerts, which I'll, I'll go over in a minute. And we also have, and I think I'm, when we send our email, we can send this to you, um, quite a few webinars so that maybe you want to learn about advocacy at a deeper level. Um, we have a webinar 45 minutes long, or maybe you want to learn more about Share Your Story. So we'll share some more resources, but wanted to mention these two up front. Um, the Advocacy Toolkit was actually the phase one of what Lindsay is going to be um, going over with you today. So we're super excited to share with you um, where we are now with the toolkit. And I think it's the next slide. Um, this is just an example of what an action alert in is one of the is it's one of the easiest ways to advocate. Um, it literally takes two to three minutes to send a letter um, to representatives on an issue that you care about, whether it's the Family Services Act or maybe um, the MAT Act or maybe the criminal justice, anything that you're passionate about. Um, it takes two to three minutes. It's again, um, just being part of change um, and a big way, and, and, and Lindsay will also go over this as part of the solution on the project that we're working with, um, that we're going to share with you today. Lindsay, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Denise. Um, and hi, everyone. I'm so um, happy to be with, here, with you today and excited to share about um, our newest advocacy resource, um, Help Us Change the Story of Addiction webpage. Um, Liz, can you go to the next slide? So um, I just want to go over sort of the various goals of this of this project. Um, you know, the first goal is really to illustrate that addiction is a journey that's marked by systemic challenges and barriers that are that are really derived from stigmatized policies. And really, um, with addiction, we often blame people for the difficulties that they face in their journey rather than the failed policies and systems with which people interact. And this blame really perpetuates a lot of the stigma around addiction, and it makes the experience with this difficult disease even more challenging. And so we really want to shift the blame from people to policies, and because that's how we're going to get to effective solutions. Next slide, please. The second goal of the website is to really harness the power of storytelling. Individual stories are an incredibly powerful way to illustrate and humanize the barriers and challenges that people with addiction and their families face. And while the website is really a collection of individual stories, these stories really represent the shared experiences of millions of people. They're the common barriers and challenges that individuals and their families face. And so for people who are, uh, who are facing challenges or in their journey, seeing that people have had similar experiences can make them feel less alone. And they can also help to reduce stigma by 
helping improve the understanding that these challenges aren't people's fault, they're the fault of systems that aren't supporting them. These stories are also really powerful tools to compel policymakers to act. Next slide, please. We, one of the major goals of the website was also to provide solutions. We know that a lot of the barriers that people and their families face can be dismantled by adopting a public, by adopting policies that are really grounded in a public health approach. And so we've drawn from our organization's extensive policy research to offer policy solutions to address each of these barriers. And we really see this website as embodying what we see as our recipe for policy change. And that's using data, the statistics, the research studies, the evidence-based recommendations, combined with the personal stories that really put a human face on the issue in order to compel policy change. Next slide, please. And finally, this is really an advocacy engagement tool. As Denise mentioned, this is really um, an interactive version of the toolkit that we created and released last summer. Um, advocacy is really, really critical to create policy change. And we hope that these stories help to really, we hope to use these stories to really harness the emotion that, can, that are evoked by these stories to compel action. And so we offer opportunities for website visitors to advocate for change. We provide links to the action alerts that Denise just shared um, to, on relevant pieces of federal legislation that are, um, that are responsive to the policy issues that we've identified. And we also provide opportunities um, for individuals to speak out and to share their own stories and to share some of this content on social. Um, because advocacy isn't just about advocating for a specific bill. We think of advocacy really broadly as speaking up, speaking out, using your voice. Um, and so that's sharing your story and you know, sharing things on social are also really important ways to advocate. And Denise is gonna talk in a few minutes about um, the tools and resources that we have to help people share their story. Next slide, please. So now I'm gonna get into um, our new tool, which is um, the webpage. Um, the URL is, is up here. It's um, drugfree.org slash change story. So it's a webpage embedded within our website. And um, this is a, a screenshot of the homepage, which is a collection of these story cards, which really um, are the, the individual stories that are highlighting the, the, the barriers and challenges. Um, and there are also links to advocacy actions such as action alerts or just links directly to um, our page where you can share your story. Um, the website features several barriers that are common to individuals and their families. And we've also selected policy barriers where we have an illustrative story we have a policy um, solution and where we can offer an advocacy action. And the barriers on the, that are represented in this website are ones that occur at every point on the journey, from missed opportunities in prevention to difficulty finding and paying for treatment to lack of support services and challenges during recovery. And our goal is really to continue to grow this webpage with more stories to highlight additional barriers and to include diverse perspectives on these barriers. I'm now gonna feature um, a few of the stories from the website to give you an idea of some of the barriers and solutions that we've identified. Next slide, please, Liz. So the web, as I said, the website includes a number of missed opportunities to prevent substance use. Joel shares how neither he nor his parents were educated about substance use or knew how to prevent it. And the problem it, with prevention is that we usually begin substance use prevention in adolescence, um, and it can often be narrow and substance specific and doesn't really address a lot of the root causes of substance use or build youth resilience, which is a really important protective factor for substance use prevention. And so this has sort of perpetually left our country um, unequipped to really prevent the next um, to protect future generations from addiction crises. And so we really need to adopt a prevention approach that starts much earlier in a child's life and continues throughout their development, and that addresses the early social determinants of child health and well being that are really critical um, for reducing substance use, but are, have traditionally fall, fallen outside of the realm of drug prevention. Next slide, please. We also. Um, look at some of the problems that have come from policies that have really criminalized substance use and the disproportionate impact that those policies have had on communities of color. Monte talks about the racial inequities in the criminalization of substance use. And he shares how black and brown communities are upset and frustrated because they, during the opioid crisis, white communities, which has affected white communities, um, 
they've received more a more compassionate response where education has really been viewed as a health issue as compared to the mass incarceration of black and brown communities that occurred during the crack epidemic. Addressing racism in drug policy and systemic racism in the criminal justice and healthcare systems is going to take multiple policy interventions. But one way in which we can try to um, reduce some of these issues is to address the fact that police are usually the default first responders for mental health and substance use crises, even though they aren't adequately trained um, or prepared to, to deal with these issues. And this has really led to millions of people being arrested and incarcerated for substance use where they're unlikely to receive treatment, the treatment that they need. And so one solution to this is to really adopt crisis intervention programs that send trained mental health professionals rather than police to respond to relevant 911 calls. Uh, next slide, please. We know that individuals and their families have encountered a number of barriers when they're trying to get help and treatment. Patty shares how once she realized her son needed help, she encountered incorrect information, stigmatized opinions, predatory providers, and an uneducated medical, uh, uneducated medical community. Quality treatment is largely unavailable because addiction treatment has historically been separated from the mainstream healthcare system. It's not well regulated and it's not held to the same quality standards as the healthcare system. And so we really need to integrate addiction treatment with the mainstream healthcare system. We can do that by training healthcare providers, by improving regulatory oversight, and requiring adherence to quality standards, including requiring that treatment programs provide evidence-based care. Next slide, please. We also feature stories from family members who share the, dif the, this, the difficulties that they face while trying to help and support their loved one. Marie shares how people, and often well-meaning people, provided stigmatizing and ineffective advice, including that she was enabling her son, that she was codependent, and that she needed to let him hit rock bottom. This advice, while common, is not supported by the evidence and is not effective. And it often makes parents feel, in Marie's words, that she was abdicating her responsibilities as a parent and abandoning her child when he needed her the most. There are effective strategies for supporting a loved one who's struggling with substance use, but they're not widely available. And one of the reasons is that there's a significant gap in federal funding for community organizations and other nonprofits who provide family support services. And so it's really critical to establish a federal grant program in order to invest in the role of caregivers and families in addressing substance use through and empower them through education, training, and peer-to-peer -peer support. Next slide, please. One of the stories that we've heard over and over again in different variations is how difficult it is for families to find affordable treatment. Virginia shares how two days into her son's treatment, her insurance company called to tell her her, her son's care was no longer medically necessary. Maureen shares how an insurance denial led her to frantically search the internet for a treatment facility where her son ended up in Florida, became involved in patient brokering, and later died after overdosing in a sober home. It wasn't until after his death that she learned an internal review by her insurer determined that his initial stay should have been covered. She was never notified. Carol was told her son needed to fail, <clears throat> excuse me, at treatment before her insurer would co provide coverage. This is a deadly practice known as fail first. Insurance would only cover brief periods of treatment when Nancy's son required long-term care. Next slide, please. <laughs> Michelle's daughter, Casey, died while waiting for, for the insurance company to approve her daughter's request for treatment. And while still in credit card debt from other treatment programs, Barbara had no idea how she would pay for her son's Ryan's treatment. These stories really illustrate the numerous insurance coverage barriers that individuals and their families face. And this is because of continued violation of federal and state laws that are meant to prevent insurers from imposing discriminatory coverage standards, but unfortunately they still persist. And that is largely because laws, including a federal law, the, the, mental, health, um, the mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, which has been law for well over a decade, are not fully implemented and well enforced. And so it's really important to provide federal and state insurance regulators with additional tools in order to enforce the Parity Act so that families no longer face denials for coverage they are able to and they're able to obtain affordable care because it otherwise is extremely difficult for families 
to navigate an, a very complex and burdensome insurance process when they're in a time of crisis. Next slide, please. And finally, we touch on barriers and challenges that people often face in recovery. Tawanda shares how when she entered recovery, she was only given one option for recovery and, and for recovery supports, and she was never asked what type of support she needed. We know that recovery supports play a, an important role following treatment, but limited funding for these services can make them um, inaccessible or there are only limited options. Just like there is no one size fits all for treatment, there is no one size fits all for recovery. So we need also need to provide federal funding for recovery support services. Um, next slide, please. So I will stop there. Thank you so much for letting me share um, about the website. Um, and I'm going to turn it back over to Denise, who's going to talk a little bit more about how to share your story. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. We can go to the next slide, Liz. Thank you. Why share your story? This time I'm gonna read off this slide because it's really important. Um, your story can bring hope to and encouragement to others. Um, I was reflecting back on my own individual you know, journey and those of the hundreds of families that I've heard of that while this tool is 90% to really bring um, to life that system, that broken system of um, care for our constituents, um, we are also finding from our families that are visiting the page that not only does it inspire them, but they don't feel so alone. They're seeing their story um, again and again throughout this. And I can speak for myself um, when I land on this page. Um, unfortunately, our family hit 10, 12, 15 of these um, um, touch points on our journey. Um, so I just wanted to um, let you know that, yes, this is about um, changing um, legislation, talking about the problem and solution, but also as you think about your constituents, this is also a page to share with your constituents and let them know they're not alone. Um, sharing our stories can help in our own recovery. Sometimes just, you know, getting that pen to paper really makes us think about our journey and, um, and think about the, those moments in our journey, which I'll speak to later. Um, sharing our story helps us to reduce stigma, promotes understanding and empathy. Um, um, so often we hear about all the problems and solutions, but when we see those stories, it brings it to life. It takes that, that problem, that solution, um, really that piece of legislation that is, um, it just brings human life to it. And we can change hearts and minds, which creates change and a new perspective. Um, we believe at the partnership and, um, and we hear from many of our families that even if we change one heart and mind a day, we're part of that change. If we can do the next um, slide, Liz. Um, when we think about stories, imagine your constituents, I will use myself as an example. How do I take 10 years and share my story in like three to 10 minutes, right? So I think about those moments um, or think about those moments where we faced different barriers or where um, it was that moment, where, and we'll get to this on the next slide, that I knew I could be part of change. So looking for those moments to illustrate a policy barrier, um, Lindsay just brilliantly um, described all the different barriers and how through stories, we're able to paint that picture. Um, selecting stories that illustrate policy bar barriers where we have a solution and an advocacy opportunity. I'm so grateful that there is some legislation that we can tie to the problem and solution. Uh, if, if we think about um, the slide that I spoke to earlier, just retweeting that bill, right? Or sharing that piece of legislation and maybe personalizing it. Um, if we can go to the next slide, this is what will help you share your story. Um, think about it in moments, right? What was our biggest challenge? What do you wish you knew earlier on the journey? Um, my personal list, probably 10 to 15 things that I wish I knew earlier before I found the partnership. What was the first step in moving from where you are today? What are the type of things you had to overcome? My apologies for not putting my phone on mute. What are some of the common barriers that you see in your community and state? Through our advocacy work, we build this network of 
um, just wonderful human beings. This is where we find those common barriers. I think um, the best slide that highlighted that from Lindsay, for example, was um, the lack of insurance coverage, right? We had four or five and we have more stories. There's so many families that face a lack of, of a system of care and financial ruin um, because their insurance company won't provide any source of treatment. And when was the first time you realized you needed to take action on something? So again, these are just to help you frame your story in moments. Um, next slide. Um, using your story to inform advocacy. Um, again, I'm not a slide reader, but I think it's really important um, to the right. Families have been coming out of the shadows to share their experience. Stories are especially important for advocacy, advocacy regarding addiction, particularly because the deep rooted stigma surrounding prevents us from telling our stories. So many of our families and those families are your constituents. So often we are stigmatized, judged and shamed to a point where we might not have that courage to reach out for help and maybe not the courage to share our stories. Um, but what we know at the partnership, what evidence has told us that story sharing helps us to chip away at that stigma and change the narrative around this disease. Um, next slide. I am honored um, to introduce to our next guest, Tanya. Um, Tanya has been a fierce advocate in supporting families for the last 10 years. She also has helped hundreds upon hundreds of families that reach out to her every day. Um, she takes her journey through the past 10 years and her experience to help lift another family, to let them know they're not alone, um, and then some. And so Tanya, um, we are so grateful for you and we thank you for your courage your passion and your heart. And um, we thank you for sharing your story with us today. Thank you, Denise. And, and thank you really the partnership because um, it's because of the partnership that I do what I do. Um, and, and they really have, what I've learned really changed my life and changed my sons. Um, you know, my whole life, um, all, I wanted to be a mother. I knew I was gonna be a mother. Um, that was all that, you know, I could think about. I had this idea of this perfect family, this Doris Day movie, um, actually, where everything was perfect. And, and um, I ended up having five children. Um, and I remember the very first, my very first feeling of having a child, my very first child, my son, Rory, um, this overwhelming feeling of needing to protect him. You know, it was the day he was born. And I looked at him and I thought, this is, this is it. I have to protect him. You know, and the sad part is, is that, you know, when you find that no matter what you do and now, you know, sometimes we can't protect them from the pain. And that was the story of Rory. Uh, Rory died of a, an overdose, an accidental um, fentanyl poisoning, I'll call it, um, just June or July 9th of this year after he struggled for probably 15 years um, with substance use. And I remember... I remember talking to him a few weeks before he passed away and, and he was very emotional. And he told me that, you know, he hadn't been, he just was having a very emotional time. He told me he hadn't been happy since he was nine years old. And I, that just hit me as a mother. Like, how could that be? How did I not know? Um, and, and later he kind of explained it to me, but you know, when I started thinking about it and racking my brain around what, what could have happened that my son didn't feel happy since he was nine, and I realized that it really went back to, you know, what was he was experiencing that I didn't understand. And, you know, the first thing was that he was struggling with um, ADHD. And I, I really, you know, I heard, I remember now in fourth grade, I remember the um, school counselor saying to me something about, you know, if we don't, if we don't um, take care of somebody's, you know, their ADHD and we don't, do something about it, then very often somebody will self-medicate. But I never really understood what she was talking about. And nobody ever mentioned it again until eighth grade when a teacher actually said, you know, you, you should have him tested. I see that he's struggling. And, you know, everyone else saw it as a behavior issue. She saw that there was a real issue he was struggling with. And I'm thankful that she, she did let me know. But 
And by that time, he is really struggling. And I didn't even realize that by eighth grade and ninth grade, he was already self-medicating. And he was finding things that, that helped him feel better. Um, some were ADHD medications from friends. Um, but in 10th grade, it was opiates. And I, I think he, re, he actually told me, it was kind of like an aha moment for him, where all of a sudden, all the pain was taken away. All his anxiety was gone. He just said, and I remember years later, he said to me, mom, you know, I'm just so much stress. If you, if you try to opiate one time, you would, you'd understand what I mean. Everything was gone. All the pain was gone. You know, the pain was gone until the pain wasn't gone and it got worse. And it was um, senior year in high school or senior year in high school, a week after his 18th birthday. And he was stopped by the police and they had a DUI and his first possession charge. He was just 18 years old and um, he spent the next 11 years trapped in the system just for possession charges and for um, violations. Um, he had been diagnosed with ADHD and then he was also diagnosed um, with bipolar disorder. And it was so difficult to treat him because we, it, it took so long before we realized and we began the treatment and he had already found what made him feel better. So we got into the system and, you know, before, before we even got that, that ticket and that charge, I, I started looking to see if I could get some help because it, it was undeniable that, that he was in trouble. And I searched on the internet. Um, at that time, we didn't have all the information we have now. Um, even now it's difficult, but as I was on the internet, you know, I was getting calls from marketers and, you know, as soon as I said, I didn't have the cash or the good insurance for them to you know, treat him, they didn't care and they didn't talk to me. So through the criminal justice system, um, I did find out about funding for him to go to treatment and he went to his first treatment program. He missed his high school graduation um, and was in treatment, uh, which was not a great experience for him. Um, but, you know, we also thought he'd come out and he would be fine. And we didn't realize that that wasn't exactly how it worked. He ended up um, violating probation because he was given probation, violated probation the end of the year. And that was his first time um, in the county jail where he sat to see what they were going to do with him. He spent, he went to the county jail several times and, and actually prison as well and was on some court programs. And this went on for 11 years. And in those 11 years, you know, there was no, they controlled his life. They controlled, they mandated treatment. The treatment was the same every time. They never addressed the ADHD, never addressed the bipolar disorder. Um, I tried to do it on our own. You know, when he was out of their programs, out of their treatment programs, I tried to get him some help, but it was difficult because he was so overwhelmed with all this treatment that he was sent to all the time that just wasn't getting him the help he needed. And he just had enough. Um, he had always wanted, since he was two years old, he loved fishing. His passion was fishing. Um, in kindergarten, he talked about being on the, um, on the deadliest catch. That was his dream, to be on the deadliest catch. And that was always, you know, senior year in high school, that's all he wanted to do was be a commercial fisherman. But in the criminal justice system, um, he really wasn't allowed to go on a boat. And so he would sneak onto boats, get in trouble for trying to do his job. Um, he, it, you know, was just constant, um, constantly being in trouble for the symptoms of his illness. You know, and he had told me, you know, what happened with him in the criminal justice system is he felt demoralized. You know, all of a sudden, you know, people didn't want to be around him. Our family was feeling isolated, you know, embarrassed. Um, the, so the first time that he had gone to jail, I found an organization that was local um, and they were the first ones that ever talked to me about families. And they were the first ones that talked to me about him because I had heard of, you know, there were other places I could go to get help as a family member, but nobody wanted to talk about him. And everybody kept saying that I had to get well. And, I, and that's true. You know, the family has to get well, but I didn't feel comfortable pushing him aside while I got well. I, I felt like there was something else. Um, I found the partnership um, through, actually Denise found the partnership and then I followed and found the partnership and I found something different. And what happened was my relationship with my son got better. And even though he struggled, our relationship was different and we, had, we could communicate. And he, began the, he became the teacher and he started teaching me about 
what was really going on, his underlying issues and what was happening with him and how he was feeling about the system itself. Um, and, you know, I found, I found advocacy and I, and I decided that I needed to help other families and I wanted other families to stay connected like we were. Um, I got, when I got involved in advocacy, the very first thing that I worked on was the Overdose Prevention Act in New Jersey, which was um, allowing Narcan to be used by family members or um, people in recovery, anybody could have Narcan. And once that happened, you know, once that law was signed, I was hooked in advocacy and I, I really wanted to make a change. And he helped me. He would, he would tell me what the issues were. We would talk it through. He would tell me what would work, what would work for him. And I would take it and, and run with it. Um, unfortunately, he could never tell the story, which is sad um, because we hear recovery stories and we can hear family stories that we already talk about our child. But when you're struggling, no one listens to that story. And no one really wanted to hear it from him because we're so used to um, thinking that somebody who's struggling is... Um, you know, they're a criminal, you know, and that's, that's pretty much how he was described as being a criminal. Um, so in, he went through a lot of different programs. He was in ISP, which is intensive supervision program. And he, you know, he, he struggled with that program. He thought he'd be okay. He struggled with the program and he overdosed while he was on the program. And I thought, all right, this is a sign, you know, we need to, we need to get him treatment. So they took him away in the ambulance, went to the hospital, and I, I called his probation officer and said, you know, he just overdosed, and um, they're taking him to the hospital. I just wanted you to know, you know, we need to get him in treatment. I followed the ambulance, and when they released him from the hospital, and I remember I walked into the hospital first to see him, and he said to me, um, why couldn't you just let me go? It's heartbreaking. And then the sheriff's department came and when they released him, they took him to jail and I had no contact with him for weeks after that. And I, I finally got through to somebody in the state and I fought for him to get treatment. And, you know, the head of the, the head of the, the um, program was upset that we would do that to him, but that's what happened below them. You know, they didn't realize that was happening. And with the ISP program, um, you go in front of three judges and um, before you go to anything. So they brought the three judges in before they put him in treatment, that they, where they brought him to court. The three judges were there and they brought him into the courtroom in shackles. And then he tur they turned around and said, take him back out. We want to talk to his mother. And they made me stand in front of the courtroom and called me an enabler and um, threatened me never to never to reach out to somebody again, to watch my narrative. Um, I was shocked that a family member was, who almost lost their son was treated this way. And um, you know, that was my beginning of saying, I'm, I have to do something different here. Like I have to get that kind of story out. And um, I, you know, I really started talking more to people in criminal justice about how we make these changes. Um, you know, eventually he, he didn't do well with, with ISP either. I mean, these programs just didn't help with mental health issues. And um, he ended up in drug court. And um, that was his last program he was in. He spent um, four months waiting to, in jail, waiting to get into drug court to treatment because none of the treatment centers would take him until um, the psychiatrist in the jail could find the right medications for his mental health issues because no one wanted to deal with the co-occurring. Um, they just wanted to give him his meds. So it took him four months to stabilize him on his meds. And, and they, um, when he left, he went to a six month program where they just continued the meds and wouldn't, they didn't do anything with the ADHD he asked and they wouldn't do anything. When he left, there was the middle of COVID and, you know, it was a confusing time for him. You know, he walked out and they said to him, just go to meetings, but you have to go on Zoom. And he said, what, what is Zoom? Like the whole world changed while he was in treatment. He had no idea, but he had these, he was so hopeful and he was excited that, you know, after he went to, um, everybody goes to IOP, intensive outpatient program. He figured after he went to in intensive outpatient program that maybe they would let him fish. And when his probation officer told him 
that um, they don't allow people to go on the fishing boats and it just ruined, you know, that's the only thing he ever wanted. That was his job. That was his passion. And he, he just had enough. And um, he went and, and used and got in a car accident again, a violation and um, put him back in jail. He got COVID in jail, got stuck in, stuck in the jail for another four months. And it was um, right around Christmas. They were going to let him out. They were, they were going to put him into treatment and they decided that, you know, we said he was going to go to treatment. So we're making him go, even though he sat in the jail for four months and was stable. And I, I begged them to let him out for Christmas because he had missed the Christmas before. And they, they didn't even, they would ignore us. They ignored the letters. They didn't even acknowledge it. And, um, you know, that was our last Christmas that we would have had. He decided when he got out of treatment that he was done. He said, I'm not, I'm not going back to drug court and I, you know, I'll take the consequences. I'm going on a boat. I'm going, I'm, I can't take it anymore. I want to, I want my life. And he went out in the boat and he was happy. He was doing really well. And, um, no, I, I don't know when he came off the boat. I don't know what, you know, what happened, what, why he used, but he was doing really well. He was very happy. And, you know, um, all I can say is that um, I knew that, I knew that he was loved. He always let me know. He, um, it meant everything to him. You know, if I didn't know, if he didn't tell me, his friends all mentioned, all messaged me to tell me, you know, how important it was. We had the relationship we had. And, you know, all the time, I always thought that we would advocate together sometime. And I, I was hoping that down the road we would. And I found out he was advocating with me all along. And he was giving my number to family members, um, you know, of his friends, because he wanted them to have that relationship. And he wanted them to understand the pain and what was going on with their child. Um, you know, so he was very courageous. And, uh, you know, I'm. I hope that maybe we can make some changes and we can get people some real individualized care and not stop, stop putting them in the same treatment 20 times in a row and, um, you know, and help somebody like him because that's, that is what he wanted. And, you know, I had promised him if anything happened to him that this is what I would work on um, for him and for others like him. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Um, the way I introduced you, I can't, and we can't, and um, the community partners can't thank you enough from, for sharing your heart um, and your story. I think just a takeaway as to Tanya's story, you know, you reflect on that story and we hear an overdose in a hospital and, and being arrested because they um, overdosed and not treated. Um, Tanya's sitting in front of a court and ostracized and labeled as a codependent. Um, I truly believe Tanya, um, and we all do that you and your son are a special gift to us. Um, I'll worry right alongside of you to continue to advocate. Um, Nancy Dow, I read your messages. Um, it's the families that have lost um, that fill our gas tank at the partnership every day um, to make change happen why this, you know, is really important, why this project tool and, and helping us change the addiction story is um, so important. And what we heard from Tanya at some point in our story is no one else, um, no one wanted to hear from us, whether it be Tanya or Rory, we want to hear from you. We have to humanize and live this story. And um, thank you again, Tanya. So I think, you know, um, today has been almost a masterclass in how impactful hearing a story is, right? Tanya's story um, drives home the point, the criminal justice system doesn't serve people with substance use disorder, um, that, uh, that, you know, met the co-occurring disorders um, don't get treated the, the way they should. Um, and when a policymaker hears that story, accompanied by our white papers and the statistics about all these things, it is so much more impactful than if they just get the statistics. Um, they don't paint the picture, they don't pack the emotional punch. So we would love 
all of you today on this webinar to share stories if you have them. Um, we also would love for you to invite people within your networks to share stories because the stories are going to be, at the end of the day, what makes the difference. Um, so you see here um, a URL where um, you can share your story with us. We're going to be rolling out an easier way so people don't have to type something in. Um, we're going to have um, an ability for people to text a keyword to, to us um, or to use a QR code. So stay tuned for that. We should be rolling those out in the next couple of weeks and, and we'll follow up with those. But in the meantime, um, you know, we, we will share this slide deck. We invite you to, um, to, to share this URL with your network so that we can get more stories and, um, and really get the point across to policymakers that, um, that the system is broken and in a lot of places and we have a lot of work to do. Um, you know, people shake their head at the fact that there was a drastic increase in overdoses and say, what a shame. Um, but it's not just what a shame, it's, it's shame on us for not fixing the places that we know are broken. Um, so, so um, I hope that we can all work together to, um, to change this. So um, Liz is going to talk a little bit about our community partner network, and then, um, then we'll go into a, a Q&A period. Thanks, Marcia. Um, so this is kind of a housekeeping note for everybody before we go into the Q&A. A lot of the people in this audience are uh, members of the community partners network already. Some of you um, are new to uh, to our kind of circle here. So I wanna tell you a little bit about it and invite you to join if you're part of a nonprofit that deals with um, substance issues or mental health issues. Um, so this is a free program made up of nonprofit organizations across the United States. We currently have 130 members in 39 states and are growing quickly. Um, and it's very easy to join. You just go to this link here, drugfree.org. Um, become a community partner and there's a kind of brief enrollment form. Um, so it's not open to treatment providers. It's not open to for-profit businesses. It's just for the locally based um, nonprofit organizations around the country to um, give everybody a chance to share resources, pull together, access our resources. Um, we have a, a newsletter that comes out regularly, these webinars like this one, um, and you know, our, our quarterly meetings where I'll usually have someone from the partnership present something that's of interest to the partners. So um, we'd love to have you join and um, thank you very much for joining us today and we'll go into the Q&A now. Great, so if, if folks have questions, um, you know, we invite you to put them in the chat um, and we can go through them. Um, uh, as, as we as we see them, we do have a couple of questions that people submitted um, beforehand um, to us. So maybe we can just start with those. Um, first one, and, and Denise, I would love your thoughts on this. Um, someone asked, I want to tell my story, but it's painful. How much or how little should I tell? Can you talk about that for a moment? Sure. Thank you, Marsha. Um, we at the partnership understand that. Um, Sometimes it's just too raw, right? How do we begin um, to share our story? Um, what we have found through working with families is maybe just practicing with that loved one. Um, look for safe opportunities to share your story. And maybe that just begins with commenting on an op-ed, on an online story, right? And just sharing like, this affects me and here's why. Um, consider consider user generated content. I think Marsha just shared with us um, that we will and we will provide you with this information, the ability to share your story. Maybe not necessarily in moments, but maybe just here's what here's what my family went through. Right? It's just that first step of courage and and willingness to share your story. Um, and, and we appreciate that. I mean, I think Tanya really shared with us, like she found the partnership, right? And it's, it was through our stories and our work that kind of gave her that, that okay, that, you know what, I'm not gonna be judged and shamed for sharing my story. And, and these are my people, this is my tribe. So great um, opportunity to share your story. Um, the other thing I'd like to say to you is it doesn't have to be, you know, this big story of policy and legislation, share from your heart and authenticity. Um, it, whether it's a moment, uh, a moment of your story or the entire story, um, just share from your heart. Um, 
which is really important. Um, we do have resources too. Um, Often we don't want to serve up the resources, you know, almost like here we are, this is what we have, um, but we're all here um, for you um, if you would like to share your story. And if it feels too raw, um, we're here to help you. Um, I think it's our collective stories in the hundreds of thousands that help us lift our voice and really inspire others to share their story. Thank you, Denise. And I just saw a comment in the chat about um, and thank you to, to John Byram. Um, uh, a lot of times we only hear about the failures of the system. We need to hear about successes and systems mm -hmm. that work. Mm -hmm. And he points to San Diego um, County Behavioral Health System as an example. And I, I think that's a really important point um, that, that are, if there are things that are working, we need to highlight them and say, do more of this. Um, so that's, that's a really important point. And thank you um, mm -hmm. uh, for, for sharing that. Um, and Marcia, and then, just to yeah. piggyback on that, you know, stories of hope are just as important, right? When we think of well, when we think of the lack of steady family funding um, streams for us, which is pretty much zero, um, sometimes we need to hear those stories of hope that help that legislator or um, organization really paint that picture that yeah, our, the money that we put into this is worth it. There are stories, and families do heal. And, and Tanya knows this and why, and she shares those stories of hope as well. So I just wanted to piggyback on that, that it doesn't always have to be um, the failure, but what we did as a family and as a community and that story of hope really matters. Sorry, Marcia. No, that's, that's a great point. And, um, and, and, you know, part, some of the stories that we really would love to have as well are, are those stories of hope and recovery. Um, and, and for families who, you know, they're, they're great for policymakers because they're proof that treatment works. They're proof that people do get better. People do recover, but more importantly, they're really important for the families who come to our website or other people's websites um, to see. Um, so that there's light at the end of the tunnel and they know that there, there is hope and that this isn't a forever thing. And, you know, I remember um, years ago uh, when the methamphetamine epidemic was, was um, raging in the, in the 90s, you know, there were a lot of federal officials who would say um, people don't recover from methamphetamine. And they would make these sweeping statements that were just wrong and, um, and, and really damaging to families um, because they would give up hope on their, for their loved one. Um, and really you know, um, uh, we're irresponsible. And so we want to make sure that we're contributing to, to the hope. And that's, you know, if there's, if there's, uh, if there was a word salad of, of, you know, uh, partnership meetings, um, hope would be the giant word in the middle, um, that we, you know, always, um, we always come back to, um, and, and making sure that, that we're, um, we're focused on that and we keep our, keep our eye on that. Um, another question, and Lindsay would love your thoughts on this. Um, for those who aren't ready to tell their story, are there still ways that they can be an advocate? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, we have action alerts, Denise, um, which is a really easy way to let your uh, representatives know that you care about an issue um, and that you care about a bill. Um, you know, elected officials are very responsive to what their constituents care about. And they hear from a lot of people about a lot of different issues and they don't tend to hear a lot of voices on substance use issues. Um, so, you know, sending a, a, an action alert, which is essentially um, a letter that is just generated. You just have to enter your, your name and your um, zip code, I believe. Um, and it will generate a letter just, you know, showing that there's support and interest for a bill. Um, Denise talked about social media engagement. Um, where you could, you know, um, like or retweet uh, things that organizations are putting out, um, you know, that you, that you agree with, or, uh, you know, your elected officials, that's a really important way um, to engage. And, um, you know, there are, you could also do, you know, letter to the editor or other ways in which you're showing support um, for this issue without having to share something personal. Um, so again, we just think of advocacy as, as using your voice, as speaking up, um, but it certainly doesn't have to be in an in a incredibly personal way, um, just you know, showing that this is an important issue to you. Fantastic, Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Um, so it looks like our hour is up. Um, I just wanna thank everyone for 
uh, for being with us today. And a special thank you to all of our panelists, um, especially Tanya, for, for being um, so brave and telling your story and for being such a tireless advocate um, uh, and, and representing um, Rory so well. So um, thank you everyone and please reach out. We have contact info here for Lindsay and Denise and um, I think you all have Liz's contact as well. Um, so please reach out if you have any questions um, and we'd love to brainstorm with, with any of you about how we can get these resources out and, and, and share them with your networks. So thank you so much. Thank you everybody. Thanks everybody.